Lincoln believes B2B marketing can be B2B brilliant, B2B bold, and B2B breakthrough. How? With a platform purpose built to make B2B marketing mean more for your business. A platform with tools to help you build better relationships with your key customers, to boost your buyer's journey while building your brand. A platform with trusted data and lead generation you need to beat your KPIs, drive ROI, and stand out amongst the competition. And with the targeting tools on LinkedIn, you can reach your precise audience right down to their job title, company name, location, and more to make sure your ads are always seen by those who matter. So let's get ready to be too boldly go where no marketer has gone before because LinkedIn is where B2B is everything you can be. Rethink your B2B marketing ads and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash mpn to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash mpn. Terms and conditions apply. Entrepreneurs Enigma is a podcast for the ups and downs of entrepreneurship, so the wins and the fails that we all face being entrepreneurs, and how we learn from adversity. Every week, I talk to a different entrepreneur with a story to tell. I'm Seth Goldstein. Come with me on the journey. This is Entrepreneurs Enigma. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the Entrepreneur's Enigma Podcast. I'm Seth. Today I am here with a good friend of mine, a philosopher, Ooh. Tanner Campbell of Practical Stoicism Podcast. He is a podcast audio engineer by trade, or he's an audio engineer by trade, specializing in podcasting. Am I, is that a better way of phrasing it, Tanner? Yeah, my whole resume is a little complicated and varied, <laughs> so I forgive you. And I find it necessary to say I am a philosopher in the traditional sense in that I seek knowledge, yeah. but I am not a credentialed PhD-holding oh. philosopher. Oh, that's important that's a, to that's, say that's, these that's, days. Yeah, yeah, that's overrated, though. I mean, come on. <laughs> and expensive. Oh, very expensive. Yeah, exactly. So that's still, you're a philosopher because you can, people can be journalists now and not be credentialed. So like, you, you can do your thing. That's true. You just need a blog, I hear. You need a blog or a podcast. Hey? And, I was, and I was a credential journalist for six years, so go figure. Anyhow, Tanner, you've done a lot, and you're a reasonably young gentleman. And so let's go into it. Like, let's talk about your background. Like, how did this all get started? Oh, boy. How did it all get started? Um, in podcasting, so when I was, gosh, I don't know. I was probably like six or seven. I've told this story just a couple of times. <laughs> um, I was at my grandmother's house in Connecticut, in Western Connecticut. And my sister and I, who was just a year and a half younger than I am, uh -huh. we had this little play school recorder. You probably remember it. It mm -hmm. had a phone cord and a plastic microphone, and it would record to a tape. Mm -hmm. And we used to love the show Pound Puppies. Oh, and so we would puppies. watch Pound Puppies, and then we would make a recording of our take on the episode of Pound Puppies. And oh, my we God. We would take it down. Uh, to my grandma, who, bless her, uh, would actually listen to it and, you know, let us, oh, what a great show. So, <laughs> so you were podcasting I say that, before there was podcasting. That's, that's how I feel about it. I had the concept of uh, radio maybe really, really yeah. early and uh, podcasting, I guess, maybe. maybe well, you, but you had still. your hot take on Pound Puppies. That's awesome. Yeah. So I would say that's where a love of media started. But as mm -hmm. I got older, I didn't really – consider myself to be very artistic or creative. And to be quite honest with you, I forgot about that for a very long time, that that was ever something that I was into, recording my own voice. I remember, of course, after having reflected on that story, I remember having video recorders and old tape recorders just around the house because my father was, at one point in his varied career, <laughs> was a private investigator. And so oh, those kinds of things were around. And I didn't awesome. really remember that any of that was fun or impactful for me. But in 2010... I discovered podcasting, which is a few years after podcasting started, which, you know, 2005, 2006, yeah. we can argue about that. Yeah, and sure. I thought, hey, here's something that I kind of, I like, I have the gift of gab. I am a decent mm -hmm. speaker. I've got you opinions. Got voice. Like, oh, yeah. thank you. I've got an opinion like everyone else does. And, you know, maybe this audio thing is a medium through which I can be creative. And so my girlfriend and I started a podcast, and really my love of the medium just kind of continued from there. And in 2015, led to me standing up a small home studio where I took in the business of others as a 
a podcast producer or mostly a podcast editor and engineer. So That's, people yeah. thought, hey, your stuff sounds really good. Of course, I had imposter syndrome all over the of place. Course, I didn't yeah. think it sounded great. But I thought, okay, sure, I'll take your money and I'll <laughs> – um, and run. I'll edit your show, but if you don't like it, don't tell anybody <laughs> how terrible I actually am because I'm sure you'll be unhappy with this. But they weren't, and the client list kept growing until in 2017 I moved to Maine. There's a whole story about that, but I, I, for the sake of everyone listening, I won't put you through that. But I moved to Maine to take a job with the United Way of Greater Portland as an IT engineer because cool. the career I had in the background of all this was – IT, probably for 20 years Oh wow! before I left it. And while at that job, I realized that it didn't matter that I had moved from IT in the business world to IT in the nonprofit world. Mm -hmm. I didn't like IT. I didn't get any fulfillment of it, out of it. Ugh, yeah. And I was still editing those podcasts for those podcasters that joined me in 2015 with that studio I had in Florida. That's wild. And so I got this crazy idea that I would open up a studio in this little breezeway of the Camden Bank building where they used to have an ATM, but it wasn't there anymore and they were renting the space. And I thought, you know, that's not a very, you know, you can't record in there. It's all glass, but it would yeah. have good foot traffic. And it actually wasn't my idea. It was a friend of mine named Ken who worked at United Way with me, gave me the idea. And I thought, that's a stupid idea, Ken. And then I thought about it <laughs> for a couple of friend. days. Yeah. yeah, I thought about it for a couple of days. And I said, okay, I mean, sure, why not? I couldn't record in there, but I could do my work in there and I could get some visual, people could see me and who knows, maybe a business could come out of that. And that's exactly what happened, except I didn't get that space. Oh. I wound up chasing it down and the guy who rented the space was really open to it, but he ultimately said, look, the Camden Bank people and the lawyers on the floors from the second floor to the top floor, they just are worried you might have really divisive material, pornographic material. I'm like, oh, these people God. don't know what a podcast is, clearly. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> but, but okay, I mean, I get it. But at the same time, I was standing up kind of a Studio B across the bridge in South Portland as opposed to Portland in Maine, and that went through. And so I started taking clients, editing clients and recording clients in what was a very, a very ragtag at first studio with just some crudely put together acoustic panels on the wall and some basic equipment, a couple of Shure SM58s. Yeah. And I think the board I was using at the time was a Zoom Live Track L12. Oh, wow. And so it was it was basic in every way. And, and I just started getting clients and more clients and more, yeah. clients and more clients. And it worked, yeah. And then the pandemic hit after Ugh. I invested all my profits from 2019 into construction expansion and doubling my space. Oh, and so 2020 it. was the big pivot, everybody probably mm -hmm. remembers. And that's where I more formally shifted into consulting because yeah. what I discovered was through online courses and other things I was teaching around audio engineering and around podcast production and podcast marketing, I realized that I didn't need the studio to make a lot of money. In fact, <laughs> the studio was less profitable than consulting was because, as anyone who listens to this show probably knows, consulting has very little overhead. Your overhead's your time, really. Yeah, and your and time and, and your phone bill. And the Zoom bill. <laughs> yeah, right. That's that's pretty much it. And so I pivoted pretty heavily, quickly, and strongly into online courses exclusively and was eventually identified as someone who really understood how to grow podcasts, which was an equation that most people had not solved. We're going to take a quick break, hear from our sponsors, and get right back to the show. LinkedIn believes B2B marketing can be B2B brilliant, B2 Bold, and B2 Breakthrough. How? With a platform purpose-built to make B2B marketing mean more for your business. A platform with tools to help you build better relationships with your key customers, to boost your buyer's journey while building your brand. A platform with trusted data and lead generation you need to beat your KPIs, drive ROI, and stand out amongst the competition. And with the targeting tools on LinkedIn, you can reach your precise audience right down to their job title, company name, location, and more to make sure your ads are always seen by those who matter. So let's get ready to be too boldly go where no marketer has gone before because LinkedIn is where B2B is everything you can be. Rethink your B2B marketing ads and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN. To claim your credit. That's LinkedIn.com slash MPN. Terms and the conditions apply. 
Oh yeah, uh, and still, and we're still we're, for the most part we're still struggling to figure that out. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the answer is you spend a lot of money, but you spend it strategically, and that's exactly, unfortunate. But yeah. that's kind of the way the industry has gone. Uh, and I started to get clients. You know, I worked mm-hmm. with IBM, I worked with Dell, I worked with Remax, and I started to do. You know, these were probably maybe not their primary big brand productions, but they were regional productions that were happening yeah. in New England. And I got to meet some celebrities that I worked cool. with, and it was very cool. All of a sudden, something that started as in 2015 as just this casual thing I was very shy about really saying I was good at had blossomed into a brick-and-mortar studio business, which fell victim to the pandemic, which then yeah. led to me being able to say, look, I've been doing this long enough to feel confident. I actually do know what I'm doing, and I'm yeah. just going to hang out my shingle as a consultant, and we're going to see how it goes and as a teacher, and it went well. Yeah. And it finally happened for me, as I've done for my clients. I've helped them to grow to five- and six-figure-a-month gross revenue revenue streams. Finally, I've gotten to the point where I've done that for myself with yeah. the Practical Stoicism podcast. And now I am a full-time philosophy content creator that with is Glassbox wild. Media, which is pretty crazy. That is wild. I first found you on Good Pods because mm-hmm. um, they liked you over there. And it was back when your when the former podcast was called Podcasting Sucks. So of course I had to check out what the hell this Joker was talking about because podcasting doesn't suck. And what it turned out to be was that it was a tongue in cheek kind of way of saying like it, there's suckage in podcasting. Yeah. But podcasting in itself is good. But there's some stuff that sucks. Like it getting found, you have to spend money. You know, and like that's one thing I've always resisted. I've always said I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this for the exposure. But the idea that there's different ways of going about podcasting. And if you want to make money podcasting, you should be listening to the back catalog of Tanner because he has the ideas of how to really make money doing podcasting full time. And then there's other ways of doing it. Like there's ways to use it for a business way to introduce yourself to people, to meet people, have an excuse to reach out to them on LinkedIn. Hence the reason why I'm doing this. Um, And it's fantastic. So, Tanner, you've done the entrepreneurial journey. What is the best thing about being an entrepreneur versus being a cog in the IT world? For me, it's probably that I have ADHD, mm-hmm. actually me too. formally diagnosed with ADHD, and I was just never great at being an employee. Same and here. the reason for that, well, and if everybody who listens to this show is entrepreneurial, either because they're already entrepreneurs or they know that they want to become them, mm-hmm. you know this feeling. It feels like you figure out the answer six months before everyone else comes to the same answer, and you've got to be patient and you know pretend like you don't already know for the sake of other people's egos. And, oh, it sucks, yeah. And and if you step out of line, if you can't really watch yourself, as I couldn't <laughs> at the time, you don't last at a lot of places because they're like, look, you want to solve these things too quickly. Look, you're expecting too much. And I never mm-hmm. really enjoyed the fact that working in the IT world, it was really hard to be nimble. It was really hard to be able to act quickly on new information. Everything was so slow to turn the boat. And I hated that. And, you know, I've gained an appreciation for how big of a pain in the ass I must have been as an employee. (laughs) Because I've now, of course, had my own people who fit, not really necessarily formal employees, but contractors that I have to work with and take responsibility for. And I now have, or I have had in the past, people who you know work for me and are kind of like I was when I worked for other people. So mm-hmm. there's the a little thing. bit of a 360 of understanding and some balance of my thinking on those kinds of things. But I'd say the best part is that I got to make my own decisions for better or worse, that the buck really did stop with me, that you know, some people are terrified by that. My wife, Brittany, she doesn't know how I do it. There were times during the pandemic where, for example, our actually prior to the pandemic, our apartment flooded. And it's not just, it wasn't just our apartment. It was a basement apartment that I had personally built from scratch from an unfinished basement just two months before it flooded and ruined everything we owned. And some people can't stand the tension, the the stress of life and that the stress of life, which occurs for everyone to varying degrees, is just just magnified Mm -hmm. almost limitlessly when you also decide, hey, I'm going to be the person in charge for generating the necessary interest (laughs) 
to gain the money to even deal with the life things. Mm -hmm. And so she's always, how did you even, how did you put up with that? It's, there were some months where I didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. It's, it's terrifying. But there's something about that. There's mm -hmm. something about being in a heightened state of concern and flow. Some people call it or focus or in the zone. And there, it used to be true that some of that mania needed to be present in my life for me to function well. And that consulting and entrepreneurship definitely created that environment for, oh, it again, for better does. or worse. It absolutely does. And so what keeps you up at night when it comes to entrepreneurship? I think I'm maybe fortunate that there aren't a lot of things that keep me up at night. My head hits the pillow and I'm just out. I don't <laughs> find myself stressing about things very often, but I do find myself stressing about things during the day, which yeah. I think maybe most people would carry into their sleep. But <laughs> that concern is always... I always had an issue with last minute problems that would happen when it came to closing a deal or getting an invoice on time. And so I was always very fearful of the collection of money, not fearful of successful collection of it, but it was always very stressful yeah. whether or not somebody who was even on a recurring contract, whether they were going to pay their invoice on time. And money was so tight for so long that if they didn't pay their invoice on time, Man, oh shit, I might have to float a couple of bills here and be late and maybe have my yeah. credit affected because I'm not, my margins were not that fat when I started. In fact, during the pandemic, I, my car was repossessed. Oh, so that was no. something that was like that kind of stuff. Man, that kind of stuff happens when you're all on your own and yeah. you're the only person you depend on. I think, like most people, I feared the unknowable things that might come my way because I didn't have a lot of resiliency in mm -hmm. 2018, 2019. And it's funny to me that resiliency is far from a business perspective. It's funny to me and interesting maybe and maybe something worth talking about. Yeah. That resilience was built in the most difficult time that I think my generation, I'm 39, yeah. has known outside of um, the fallout of 9-11, of course. But that had there was a different kind of impact on. It was, absolutely. I'm 41 and ex exactly. I think the pandemic and to some extent 2008 when I started mm. my agency, best time to start a business. There's those, those three things I feel like I, at least affected me was 9-11, which I remember where I was. I remember like the whole day, like the back of my hand. 2008, because it was actually positive for me. because I started a business when the whole world was coming crashing down. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the pandemic, everyone, everyone's been affected by that. But that's, those are like the three milestones for me. But here's the question. What is the most important thing to carry with you all the time? Oh, that there's just so much that you don't have control over and that stressing over it or after it is, it's just such an immense waste of your time. It's so have, true. Having to remember that you have the ability to probably duck and weave a lot and that it's important to prep yourself to be ready for the worst case at all times because you've got to except that you can't stop the worst case from happening. You can only, you know, do, you could do your best to prevent it by making smart decisions. But ultimately, for example, the pandemic, nobody could control whether or not that was going to happen. No. People just needed to be in situations that they were survivable during it. Some people could be and weren't, and some people could have never been. For example, when the pandemic hit, everybody knows that if you were self-employed, you couldn't claim unemployment until <sighs> eight months into the pandemic. Yeah. And that probably hurt a lot of people. I was fortunate in that my wife and I had a pretty significant savings that we could chew through. So that's an example of I had no way of knowing a pandemic was ever going to happen. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but I had the foresight to make sure that there was there was disaster money yes. to live off of in case of X, Y, Z. And, and we lived in Maine, so what disaster was going to hit Maine? That's what anybody would say. We don't have earthquakes. Yeah. We might have an avalanche, but it's not happening in town. <laughs> you might have a flood in Portland. We might have a, a good norista or something, but that's a, that's about all that's no. going to happen. And you don't, yeah. you'll have your bread and your milk, and you'll hunker down for a couple of days, and you'll be fine. But being prepared for the worst financially maybe is important, but also mentally. Mm -hmm. I remember when the pandemic first hit, there was a lot of conversation about making your business pandemic proof. <laughs> and it's interesting that we had never had that conversation before. It's not as if there were not pandemics or endemics no, prior there's in been the a bird bunch flu of thing. That, yeah, yeah. But this one was different, probably mostly in response in how the country responded to it. But yeah, we'll leave, also that, one alone. We'll leave that one alone. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I have some views on that one to say the least, but you know, 
I actually had the honestly, man, I'm not gonna throw it at the administration per se, but how the whole world responded. I think we all had were caught with our pants down on that one. Yep, hundred percent. It was a scary time. But Tanner, this has been so much fun. Where's your watering hole online? Where do you hang out the most? Well, you can find me at TannerHelps.com. You can also find me anywhere on pretty much any social platform at Tanner Helps. So that's yes. Twitter, Facebook, TikTok. But lately, because I've taken on this role of full-time philosophy writer and content creator, yeah, that's wild. you're really finding me at StoicismPod.com. And I would invite anyone who mm-hmm. is interested in learning about Stoicism, especially for someone who thinks – Oh, I know what Stoicism is. It's a bunch of people who don't have any emotions and don't care about anything. That is your understanding of Stoicism. I would love for you to check out Practical Stoicism, the podcast, anywhere you listen. Yes. uh, Because one of the things that is my mission with this is to dispel a lot of those rumors and modernize the philosophy as our own human morality has been modernized over the last 2,000 years. We have to update our philosophies in order for them to remain useful to us and worth following and if anyone knows tanner he has emotions (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's true usually (laughs) frustration is a big one (laughs) the frustrations we've been friends for a little while now you have pivots and stuff and it's not a bad thing to have emotions but it's also learning how to control your emotions which is i think a big part of stoicism is learning to be like keep things in perspective (laughs) Yep, learning that emotions can get in the way of you acting with utility. And so we mm-hmm. want to have our emotions. Everybody's got them. You can't stop yourself from having them. But to get them under control as fast as possible so you can begin to be useful in solving that problem or dealing with that issue. Awesome. Tanner, this has been so much fun. Thank you for being on, and we'll see everyone next week. That was a great show. Hey, if you're enjoying Entrepreneur's Enigma, please give us a review on the podcast directory of your choice. We're on all of them. And these reviews really help others find the show. Also, if you're getting value from the show and want to buy me a coffee, go to the show notes and click on the link to help me stay awake while I bring you more great episodes to your ears. That's in the show notes, and I look forward to the next episode. Take care, guys. Media hopes you have enjoyed this episode. This podcast is one of the many great shows on the MPN Marketing Podcast Network. This podcast is part of the MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. Another great MPN podcast you'll enjoy is PR Talk, a show that digs into the modern side of public relations through interviews with thought leaders, authors, and the media on PR Talk with the Marketing Podcast Network. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.